All right. Uh, so APEC is uh, getting ready to start, isn't it? Or has it already started? I have no idea. Um, I don't have a, a link to their website. Do you? No. Do you want to just watch it and just commentate on it? Uh, just watch it later. I, I prefer what we're doing now. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just continue this for a little bit then. Because honestly, I don't, I don't like the idea of going, leaving here and going onto a Zoom call. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, yeah. If 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 you guys really want us to to cover some APEC, let us know. But for now, yeah, Nathan, we're we're just gonna continue on with this. I'd like that. Good idea. So with that, I can continue on with what I had prepared, which was the Sean Murray hack job on the Hutchison effect and that was very um sad to see but we have to cover it because as you know um we oh, have hold to hold on, hold, on. hold on you're not talking about that little orange ball are you in the string yeah. uh spoiler alert don't show, <laughs> don't show it i have to i uh, have to that's junk it is that's, it's absolutely no because it's a complete lie it's but I have to explain. I have to explain the story though, so people understand. That's all, you know. And and if you do a little bit of research on this, and and that's that's where Sean Murray went wrong with that is, if you do a little bit of research, you'll understand that that was uh, a total hack job on John Hutchison regarding the the um, coverage he was getting. So that the, I guess they had a um, camera crew come over. And he was having trouble replicating some of his experiments because, you know, as you know, uh, he was, I think he was doing it all by intuition, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like sometimes uh, when you're doing stuff like that and you don't have it written down and you're doing it by intuition, you know, you can't just make something happen right away. And they were waiting for something to happen and they're like, oh, well, why don't you film this UFO with a, you know, a fishing line on here and, and demonstrate what you can do? And they filmed it in a way that the line was obviously visible, and they kept it in. And I, I feel they did it intentionally, honestly. Dude, it I was think. a setup. No, no, that, that's a government a setup. Hack. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so a setup. Hack came yeah. in the room and made him do it. You know, no, I, I, I won't even tell you that. So, that's yeah, okay to play. No, it's okay. Show. Yeah, we'll just explain the video. Yeah, we don't have to show it. You know, you're right because it is. It's very disrespectful to anybody actually researching this stuff. You know, like this. Uh, and Sean Murray has a big following, and it's 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 sad to see. You know, you're doing a great disservice to your viewers when you do this stuff. He he set the whole thing up like he was going to actually replicate the experiment too. He he misled his audience, and then at the very last minute, he's like, "Oh, and this is how it's done. And it's a fishing line." And he shows a little clip. Oh my god! Yeah, dude. No, I, I as soon as I saw that, I turned it off. Mike sent it to me earlier. I didn't even watch it. It, dude. No, never. <laughs> no, he's like, just no. no. Yeah. No, you're right, Nathan. You're right. Uh, it's just something that I wanted to talk about at least, you know, because that's important to understand, you know, when you're a researcher, you have to just not take things at surface value. You got to go deeper. You know, you got to do all the digging you can, not just uh, what other researchers have done and Google it, you know. Yeah, part of the problem is they don't understand what he was trying to do, what Hudson was yeah. trying to do. They, they don't understand, you know, the waveforms he was putting into it and why it would work. And, you know what I mean? Right. It, makes, it makes a huge difference. And if they did, then they would understand it. But showing somebody with a string, dude, I'd never put that on my channel. It, yeah. You know, I'd never put something because you don't yeah, want it's, to put people in the wrong direction. And, exactly. It's disingenuous, you know, yeah. and I was... I was talking to you even about maybe having like a scavenger hunt and, you know, like I, you mentioned it, it might sound a little gimmicky and I think you, you might be right. You know, I don't want to put anything out there that sounds gimmicky. I just want to get people interested. That's all. You know, I want to get people excited and well, I'm trying to inspire is, people. This is but the it, best way to do it, Ben. Just get out yeah. the experiments, get out the videos, tie them together, make people see how they work together, get them thinking. That's the way to do it. Absolutely. And uh, visuals are key and especially in this you know people a lot of people aren't going to believe it until they see it with their own eyes you know i i still fight with some some of my friends you know like on the stuff you know like uh, i have friends who still don't believe me you know like i, I want to see it you know come over i'll show it to you <laughs> yeah 
Well, that's actually all I had was that uh, if anybody has any other hack jobs we we can cover um, or anything else that you'd want to present, Nathan? Uh, or not the, not the hack jobs. We'll just cover the good stuff. <laughs> just the good stuff? Okay. Okay, I see where you're going with this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, talk a little science theory, a little bit of what's going on, you know what I mean? But, yeah, I'm not not interested in the hack job. Not, not in any way. That's been well, easy. there is there is a theory, and in retrospect, you might be right in this. Uh, you know, any coverage, even if it's negative coverage, is good coverage. So, yeah, yeah. No, I don't want to. No, I don't agree with that. Nope, not not in the slightest. In regards to the algorithm, yeah, we don't want to give it any attention. <laughs> is that where you're going with this? Yeah, no, I'm trying not to say anything, Ben. You you know, I just try to keep that to myself. It's just. Well, the thing is, uh, sometimes we have to break down these uh, disingenuous uh, videos in, 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 in a way that the audience understands that this isn't actually legitimate. So um, with that, I think uh, it's important to uh, differentiate between personal attacks and trying to actually do real science and pass it off or do fake science and pass it off like it's real. And that's that's the thing that I see is a lot of a lot of videos they're fake and they pass them off as real. Like Mr. Beast is notorious for doing this. And oh dude, did you that whole controversy? That was wild. Yeah, and it's 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 disgusting. And like you said it it brings out a visceral response in me and and you're right. Don't even bother touching it with a 10 foot pole. So, I'm not. And I'm going to take your advice on that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I just, there's no room for that. Well, it, it goes back to focusing on the positive, and it's hard in this society. You know, everything's so confrontational. But, uh, yeah, I like to try to focus on the positive, so that's the route I'm going to take here. But, uh, right. again, um, uh, I did only have that hack job to cover, so um, I don't have anything else uh, to present at the moment. So if you have anything to present or you'd like us to discuss... Uh, if not, then I'll just probably put on some videos that uh, we haven't seen yet of Bedini. Oh, yeah. Give me just a few minutes uh, while we're talking. And I I'm looking up something right now. Mm, okay. So he's going to prepare something for us while we uh, check out some more Bedini videos from his channel. But yeah, man, you got to focus on the positive. It'll drive you nuts. All right, old man builds, and then we're gonna present this right here. There we go. All right, so we've dived pretty deeply into his archive, but still we haven't even touched the bottom of all the content that he has available regarding free energy um, and all these really hard to find videos. Floyd Sweet, you know, we got John Bedini, John Hutchinson, Marco Rodin. Oh, I, I got it. Hold on, hold on. Oh, hold you on. got it? Yeah. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this guy, but uh, I, I love this old guy, man. When he gets on talking. Have you ever seen this guy? Can you see it? Is it on the screen? Yeah. Yeah, it's on oh, there. Okay. okay. I mean, I'll hit play for you. Um, this is on the Via Mono video that I did. And he's talking about resonance and inside pipes, outside pipes, stuff like that. And it's kind of everywhere. And I was talking today uh, with Sean about a Tesla coil. And at the very top of the Tesla coil, you got the Tesla coil like this, right? Then at the top, they show it with this uh, tuning fork, right? So when this guy's talking about the both pipe things, right? And then you have to imagine the Egypt when they showed that, the tuning fork coming out. So if I set the Tesla coil, say, at 430 hertz, and then I took a tuning fork at 200, or 432 hertz, whatever, you know, the same number, it would resonate the tuning fork. 
as long as it's inside the pipe, just like it would be if you put a tuning fork in a box. So this guy's the best at it right here. I'll, I'll hit play. Front of this open pipe. Uh, who is this guy again? Resonance. I forgot Consider his... now the following. I have here two cardboard tubes, one of which slips inside the other so that I can change the total effective length. I am going to strike a tuning fork and hold it in front of this open pipe, which is so long, which has a certain natural frequency. I'm going to change the length by this sliding tube and hope to find a resonant length for this fork. Listen now. Yeah, there is a place. There is a place at which this length is resonant to this frequency. That's an open pipe. This end is open, that's open. Here is a closed one. Now, it would be an interesting exercise to compare the lengths of the open and closed pipes for the same fork, but I leave that as an exercise for you. This is closed because it is closed on the bottom of the table. Listen. Uh-huh. Let me use another fork. This fork happens to be, what, uh, uh, 512, that's uh, an octave above middle C. Oh, I can't get a length there. There it is. There it is somewhere in there. Let me try this open one. Very clearly resonant. Very clearly. As you can see in this experiment, we use a tuning fork to turn on a transformer. How interesting is that? It ties directly into our Viamana. What do you get when you cross a tuning fork hmm. with a coil of wire? Sonic electricity? Well, let's give it a try. Here I've hooked up our coil to a meter, which is set to AC. We'll whack the tuning fork. I don't know if you can hear that. And we'll bring it near the coil. And yeah. There's some residual voltage, but Oops. That's really cool. The closer I get it, the more current. The uh, trick is I gotta keep from hitting the coil. Let's take a look at our VM mono one more time. Now we can see how we get energy from frequency and resonance. When you start talking about VM monos, you have to understand sound. Now, the question is, did they understand sound? Well, let's take a look at these Hindu temples and let's see if they actually understood it. On all these temples, we see this beautiful artwork on the ceiling. What is it? Well, it's a frequency pattern. This is a Viamana carved on a temple. Under it is another mandala, but again, a frequency pattern. This is also carved into the temple. I want you to pay attention to the structure that goes from upper left to lower right. It's actually a sound wave, and you can see in it the lanterns. It's where it holds each lantern in the sound wave. Let's look at something else that looks just like it. This is a levitation experiment. We see two speakers, one on top, one on the bottom, and it holds styrofoam balls inside a sound wave just like the temple showed us with the lanterns. I wanted to show you this in comparison. We see what they have on their temple. Now, let's see if we can't see it in frequency. Wow, Nathan, this is awesome. <laughs> Crazy what you find, huh? Yeah. 
Dude, that's beautiful. Wow. This right here is the resonance experiment. As you can see, for every frequency, it puts out a different shape. There's one big problem, though. It does not look like our mandala. So what are we missing? Well, we have to go back to how the Via Mana was built. The Via Mana actually uses four tubes. So we asked the question earlier, are the four tubes exactly the same? Well, the answer is no. Two tubes are shorter than the other two. That's what gives us our pulse waves in the experiment earlier. This is why the mandala is not correct to these frequencies. It's going to require two frequencies slightly out of unison in order to make the pulse wave. That's why the mandala is different than this experiment. Wow. Now that we see some of the experiments, we're starting to put the via mana together. We're starting to understand it better. We're starting to see exactly how it works. Frequency, sound, things that we just listened to the speaker for today, they built back then to lift crafts. So interesting. They preserved their legacy by etching it in the stone. And they built crafts like this. When we look at the Amanas, do we understand what they're made of? Often we see them with a metal exterior. Is that even correct? I want to show you this experiment here. This inventor uses high voltage on a craft, and then he uses a piece of wood. The craziest thing is it attracts the wood. So what does that mean for a Viamana? Does that mean that it's also made of wood on the inside? Let's take a look. Now, if I bring this wood stick close to it, I actually increase thrust. I want to thank everybody for watching. So what he was doing there, by the way, he was just polarizing the stick. Every time it came around to it, because it has so little amps in that lifter and hit a very high voltage, it's a static electricity, but more than that, it's a polarization. So it's always attracted to the wood. Wow. This is a great video. There was some more in the beginning. You want to see the other part? Yeah, yeah, this no, guy, I love this. This guy's awesome. So we'll go right over here. He's going to turn this on. I'll explain. Focus just on the tubes. Let's go ahead and look at the rest of the craft. Let's see if we can't use experiments to identify exactly what we're looking at. In my last Viamana video, I showed you this. A simple coil heated turns on a cylinder and makes sound. But I want to show you again before we start the other stuff so that you understood where it fits. As you can see, we're using heat to activate the tubes in the Via Mana. Let's take a look at this experiment here. Last time, we used a simple coil to resonate a tube with heat. This time, we're going to take two different tubes set to a different frequency and see what it sounds like together. The result is very cool. Now, if I get one of these tubes singing at a time, it's a consistent flat tone. But listen what happens when I turn on the other one at the same time, which has a tone which is very slightly different. At this point, we simply just need to wow. decide, are all the tubes the same, or are they different? Do we need one frequency or two? You know, I often show this gentleman here because he's a master at physics. His resonance understanding is beyond belief. The things he does with these tubes, you should really pay attention to. 
this is the guy to watch if you want to understand anything about resonating tubes or resonating anything. Anyway, let's get into it. Here's the master at work. Resonance. Resonance. It goes back Consider to the now the following. I have here two cardboard tubes, one of which slips inside the other so that I can change the tone. So Sumner Miller, Julius Sumner Miller is his name. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so if you ever get a chance, watch his videos. He is just beyond he looks, awesome. He looks awfully familiar. Like I've seen him in something a long while ago. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. You'll have to pull him up one day and just play him on your channel. I'm going to tell you right now. Amazing work. Like, yeah, I'll write that down. Yeah, What's his last name? Jules. Uh, Julius Sumner Miller. Just. Give me a second. Let me. I'm gonna go back in my archive a little bit. There yeah. What do you got for us? <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a force field one I wanted to show you because it's. Uh, oh wow. Talking about fields of plasma, and it's inside a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So give me. Uh, yeah, while you're pulling that up, I'll just uh, commentate on your video real quick, which because I I love it by the way, the Vimana video, and I've been meaning to research the Vimanas, and you just provided me an amazing video full of knowledge, and I love it. Um, I I know now more than I did before, so <laughs> <laughs> like I almost honestly I didn't research the Vimanas nearly at all. Um, so uh, it's it's an interesting topic, and I want to delve into it a little bit at some point. So um, with that, uh, w when you were talking about having multiple frequencies uh, input into a plate, and that's why you know we're only inputting one frequency into the plate for cymatics, and that's why we're not pr producing the correct Mandela, um, that, I don't know if it's a connection or not, but that, that calls to me the uh, experiments with the resonant frequency healing device. And again, this is not medical advice, but there is a device supposedly that can treat cancer cells and make them explode on a, a microscopic scale, but not. Uh, they tried hundreds and thousands of frequencies, but they, they, they claim that they only got the device working when they tried a second interfering frequency. So that I, I don't know if that's a connection here, but that's important, and it just popped in my head. Hmm. Well, I think it's important for your coil... What we're talking about, when you put in one frequency, don't be so sure in the center of the coil is putting out a different frequency. And mm. together, they 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 have the two frequencies. You need a pulse. And I'm not talking a pulse in the frequencies themselves. You need a separate pulse. It's a pulse wave. The speaker under it, a piezo under it, something like that. It acts as an amplifier to the two frequencies. Right, it, it allows them to combine successfully to produce one magnificent frequency. Is that the theory, at least? It, well, what it does, it's an amplification wave. So, I could show you an oscilloscope reading. Uh, yeah, oscilloscope might be a better visual. Uh, see where I put it. I got all these video things. It basically, it's the same thing it does when you push the button on the piezo buzzer. It'll do an amplification of it. So, you know what? I might have it on my phone. Give me one second. Okay. Yeah, this isn't the Rife. I'm not talking about the Rife machine. This is the frequency, uh, the resonant frequency healing device. Um, if you go to my TikTok, I have a video on it. I don't know if I posted it on YouTube. So, okay, here, I'll, let me uh, put up my camera and I will share off of my phone. Uh, okay, I got I gotta get cancel here. Okay. Ah, okay. So yeah, watch the two waveforms. It amplifies? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's spiking. Is it? It's hard to tell. It's all amplifying together, though, right? You see that big one? Yeah. 
It's yeah. what happens when you have two frequencies and you amplify them with a pulse wave. Now, this is me just trying to get the thing where I can hit it at the right time. Uh -huh. I, I have them 180 degrees at, or 90 degrees out of phase, however you want to say it. They're just out of phase because it starts to blow up stuff in my garage. Yeah, both of the waveforms, it looks like, and sections of the wave are amplifying and just spiking like crazy. And it's it seems to be shifting from one part to the like it's going like in a timing like back and then the middle they, and then they the, try the to amplify together. Sorry, it's not such a good picture on this. I should have downloaded it. No, but it gives a good visual. That's this is exactly what I needed to visualize what you were talking about. Yeah, see that big one just happened. Yeah. Oh yeah, and every once in a while there's a real big one. So it's a yeah. little tiny spikes and then a real big spike. So. What you're trying to do is, if I hit the piezo buzzer on this, I'm amplifying both waves simultaneously. So if they were in phase together, like one overlapping the other, mm -hmm. the energy output would be massive. Right. You wonder where the amplification because comes from. It's right there. Is that because there's a differential between two the two waveforms? No, it's it's because I'm pulsing it. Yeah, Every time you see that, the that thing jump, it's the piezo buzzer I'm pushing. Okay. Yeah, and I'm just uh, I'm wondering because I know pressure differentials and instabilities, like, you know, asymmetry kind of play into these things a little bit, but that might not be the exact same mechanism here. You're talking uh, about pulsing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's just so you know, when you do your uh, replic replication of the water experiment stuff, you have to have two waves, and then both waves have to be slightly out of sync, not 100% not over each other, because you may get a runaway mm. runaway on it. What you're looking for is an amplification close to each other. So you have to think of frequency like it's uh, two ships in the night, okay? Or an AM radio band. If they are not close enough together, then they will not work together. They will just be like two ships in the night passing. They won't mm -hmm. see each other at all. But when they're close enough together, they amplify together. And that amplification mm -hmm. isn't set just one side. It's both sides, top and bottom. So it'll amplify. So if I took a longitudinal wave and a transverse wave, and I hit it with a pulse, I'm amplifying the center, just like Hutchinson, then I'm creating an energy bubble in the inside. That's what yeah. the middle apart. Yeah, I had somebody, um, I had somebody uh, on one of my live streams uh, a few days ago who gave me a video <clears throat> and, um, and some information. He was talking about, um, uh, what was he talking about? I'm trying to remember. Um, Maybe I can pull it up. Give me one second. But anyways, uh, he was talking about the Casimir effect and how there's a different version of the Casimir effect that's going to happen in electrical components when you have, um, say, uh, two things close to each other at a micro scale. And uh, I don't know, maybe that's, you know, the two frequencies or two waveforms being so close to each other that they create kind of like a charge between them. And then you just spike them and they produce an enormous amount of output. Well, mine's like, so what I'm trying to do is take the testicle, right? And you remember what I told you, it has that buildup and then you output it at the end. Well, you're trying to create that frequency to jump it right before it goes to the discharge state, okay? That's what you're looking for. That way, the amount of energy in the system is massive. It It's like Bedini's spike. You saw the bell ring, right? The mm -hmm. wave that comes up like this, excuse me, and then it gets bigger and bigger, and then boom, it outputs. That's the ring, Tesla coil ring. Right. When you amplify it at the top of the ring before it drops, you're going to get a massive output. Right. So, yeah, it's like a uh, timing and um, not just uh, timing, but knowing when to tap it, you know. Yeah. 
a lot of people are just like, oh, they got energy. I'm going to tap it right away. But no, you got to take your no. take your time with it. <laughs> it it's like it, it has to be like a firecracker in your hand. You can't have mm. your hand open a little bit, okay, like this. Mm. You can't have it like this. You have to have it shut. And you have to have it ready to explode. And then, boom, it has to hit at the right time. So that's kind of the whole key to one of these things when you do that is the amplification of something. And it, and if you understand that, then you understand why it's getting so much hydrogen. Because you, if you do create the one wave, you create the second wave, which is like a, a back EMF ring. So the rings one side, ring the other, but you can amplify them in the center of that and then it'll create the cut. And it splits both right away with that amplification. You know what I mean? With the pulse. Right. But it does the same thing in the Great Pyramid with the water underneath it. It's still hitting the top of that cavity wall. It's still coming up and hit it and creating a pulse wave. So when I say pulse wave, I don't mean like a wave in your DC signal. That's not what I'm talking about. It mm -hmm. has to be a physical pulse wave like a speaker puts out. Or a piece mm. of electric disc puts out, and that's your amplification on top of the waveforms that you have. That's interesting. So yeah, you can't just be inputting a tone uh, generator. You have to actually have some kind of uh, a force behind it, huh? Yeah, you could put it in a tone generator. Just understand that you're going to have to have a separate pulse. It's oh, not going to okay. be the pulse in there. It's not going to be the DC pulse. Not any of that. Like I said. Just put a speaker under it and then, you know, bump it mm. and, and then find out what happens. That's why I tell you, put it on, you know, a little bit of DC, DC, a little bit of Thunderstruck. You know what I mean? Right. It's a vibration. Get, yeah. <laughs> get your frequencies really high and then bump it because that's what you need. So I have another video for you. Did you have your video, Ben? No, it's, it's somewhere lost in one of my live streams. I don't remember which one it is. Gotcha. I'll, I'll, I'll show this one. We're talking about a little bit of a force field here. Mm -hmm. So the whole premise of this is that are we getting any closer to making this thing, right? And mm -hmm. creating a bubble around it. And it's with plasma. And you see plasma outside of the chamber, inside the chamber, everything where it starts to where it should be. So I'll hit play on that. Let's talk about force fields. or. Shields, if you will. Can a UFO produce a force field or a shield? Let's see if we can't find the experiments to see whether it's possible or not. Let's look into it. We see in these experiments that plasma rotates in a magnetic field. Here we see plasma rotating in between two magnetic fields. Let's take a look at plasma. Let's see if we can't make it work for us. Let's see if we can't create a field out of it and maybe start to begin to understand this. This first experiment, we're going to go ahead and rotate plasma around a magnet. We're going to see if we can't make rotational force without making the first object rotate first. Let's take a look. As you can see, the anode is the bar and the cathode is the magnet itself. And what we're seeing is a plasma field rotate because of the magnetic field. You know, people always ask, does a magnet have a field around it when it's sitting still? Well, the Earth rotates. So any motion to a magnet causes a field. So any magnet sitting just on your desk always has a magnetic field. Another interesting thing about this is how the plasma flows here. It's flowing inside, not outside of the magnet. That's because we're in Earth's atmosphere. Once we get this in a vacuum chamber, it'll actually start to flow on the outside. The exact same thing we're looking for when we have a UFO in space. Let's take a look at this next experiment. What we're trying to find out is if we can push the field out a little bit. Is there a way to put a magnet in the center and then make everything else of the plasma push out? Let's take a look. What this experiment is, is neodymium magnets stacked up one on top of the other. There is a clear 
PVC pipe that goes right over top. And the anode and cathode are on the left and right side of it. And you can see what happens here. The magnetic field allows the plasma to flow around the PVC pipe instead of trying to go through it. Now we're starting to get somewhere. We now see the plasma going out. We see the rotation from the magnet. Let's pull the field out a little more. Let's see if we can't get this thing to come around and at least get a half of a circle lit up. This right here is a vacuum chamber experiment. What's going on is the magnet is placed at the top. It's a circular magnet. And the anode is connected to the magnet. The cathode is connected outside of the outside ring of it. And what's going on is the magnet itself is forcing the plasma to rotate around in a circle on top of this object. A couple things to note here. When you're in a vacuum chamber, the amount of vacuum is important here. The more vacuum, the more that this energy field will pull out. But you get to a point where it's too much and the energy field will suck back in and it won't allow it. So you gotta get just the right amount of that. Then you also have to have the correct amount of voltage. Sometimes the voltage is too high, just makes a mess. Sometimes voltage too low, the effect won't show up. It just has to be in that nice sweet spot to get it right. In case you're new to this, when you do plasma, you have to be at night. During the day here, you can see, you can barely see the outside rings. You see a little bit of glow, depending on the lighting coming in. But the real effect happens at night. That's pretty. We're now starting to see the field create. We're seeing the rotation of the magnet. We're seeing that it itself rotates the field around. Now, let's see if we can't expand that. Let's go a little further out. Let's see if we can't get this at least halfway around. As you can see here, here's the uh, vacuum chamber that's being used. You can clearly see the wires coming into it and where they hook in. One's the outside, one's the inside, and here's the ring. I can tell you it's fairly uh, low amount of uh, vacuum that's been pulled out here, and that has to do with the plasma that's being created. It's not pu pushing out too far. It's just barely sticking in there right between the two. That's how you could tell how much vacuum's in this chamber. Now you can see it starting wow, to that's out. It's starting to make that half circle. This is very important. The next step is going to blow your mind on how it works. We're actually going to create the thing all the way around it. But this experiment shows you how to start it. We have the magnet there. We have the centerpiece. We don't have any magnet on top yet, just the bottom. And we're getting a beautiful glow coming off the bottom here. This is exactly where we want to be at this point. Now we have the understanding. We can push it to the next level. Wow. While working in a vacuum, it's like space. So now we can take the magnet on the top and put one on the bottom and create a rotational field of both. Let's see if we can get it to go fully around this time. And there it is. That's the shot that you want. Right around the whole thing, top to bottom. Now there's no plasma on top and there's no plasma on the bottom very circle at the top and very circle on the bottom. But this is what we want to see. This gives us hope for that shield. The mm. test for proving that that shield technology is within our grasp. It's hard to imagine, but here it is right in front of us. That last video was absolutely amazing. We actually got to see the plasma go all the way around a disc-shaped object. Again, if we're building this for a UFO, that is amazing. Now what we need to look into is do we need to force rotation further on the inside disc to push the field out further? Obviously too close and it just burns us up in our UFO. But if we can get it to go a little further out, we're gonna have to maybe get some more rotation in this to do that. But if we can get it to go a little further out, that's where we need to be. We need to keep this thing off the craft, not right on it. This experiment has absolutely no plasma in it, but it'll show an effect when it's spinning. You'll start to see what actually does happen when you put plasma into something, when you rotate it with a motor.
And that's important because we used magnets so far to rotate the field. Now we need to put rotation inside with a motor along with the rotation of the magnet to create the field to make it expand further. So if you're thinking this is the rotation with the motor, then we have the rotation with the magnet. What it means is the inside disc, our UFO, will be spinning as well as the magnet creating the spin as well. It gives us the exact same thing that the Earth gives us. Rotation of a planet, rotation of a field. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to how we got here. We used a vacuum chamber and we used a high voltage source and we put that high voltage into one object. That object had magnets on top and bottom in order to get the field to rotate. We also explored the possibility of rotating the object itself beyond what the rotation of the magnets gives you. So what do we need to do from here? We need to change the source of the high voltage just a little bit. Let's look into this magnetron project and let's see if we can't get the inspiration to figure this out. You're probably asking yourself, why would we use a part from a microwave for this? Well, it gives you a couple of things that you don't always get. One, it gives you the high voltage. Two, they use magnets on the outside to create the field on the inside. Now, all we need to do is expand that field a little more. We need it to go on the outside of it. And then we have the core of what we want our UFO to be. The great thing about this is a magnetron is a resonance chamber, which basically means it puts out sound and frequency. If you saw my video on the Viamana, you'd understand this a little more. It's gonna be required in any UFO craft. Here, we have our plasma, we have our high voltage, and we also have our magnets. It gives us a great piece to put in here. It's the right one to use. We are gonna have to modify this. We're gonna have to cut out the bottom and suspend the anode right in the center. We're also gonna have to take all the little railing parts that you see all the way around this thing and bring them all the way down our tube. Now, in order to push that plasma out, that's the way we're going to have to do it. It's going to take the vacuum of space to pull them out a little more. It also may end up that this is just a separate piece in the core, and we may have to build another piece at the top. But that's all in the building stage. This right here is just the theory stage, and we're trying to figure out if it's even possible. And with this, I think it is. <laughs> Somebody said Tony Stark like reactor. The field. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it has to do with the structure of it itself. It actually produces everything we need in our environment right now on Earth. The Earth has a plasma field around it right now. So why not use the same thing? And as we're traveling. Sorry, Ben, I had to pause it. I got in trouble for the last part of this video because uh, one of the creators, uh, really has this big channel now and I can't no longer use part of his video. Oh, uh, that sucks. It's okay. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll get there and uh, we'll just uh, move on to the next video or whatever. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that's all good. I liked your videos. I, I really think you've uh, upped your game on your um, production quality and all that. And it's, the information is is very informative and fascinating. So it's all the stuff that I would watch. Yeah, I I, I love that uh, that magnetron in, in the vacuum right there, where it's like opened mm. up and you can see it. It totally blows your mind of what's going on in there. And I like how you break down things for um, a more general audience, uh, like I try to do. And and you do that for me all the time, like uh, break things down so I can understand them. Like you were comparing uh, having to spin the the craft and the field at the same time, like the, the earth as a body has to spin and its field spins at the same time. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. It's been at different rates. So 
I always wonder when they calculate the speed of the Earth, do they do it based on the Earth's surface or do they do it on the field on the outside? I'm not sure. That's a good question. I think they do it based off of the surface, but I'm not positive. Because the stronger you get to the core, the more, or the the more you get, to the, the closer you get to the core, the stronger the the magnetic field, right? Yeah, that actually tells you which side's positive. Positive mm. side is always the stronger side, and negative is so. always the weaker. We often consider the outside of you know of our Earth to be the positive, and that we're mm. standing on the negative, but that's not true. Inside of the core is the positive. The outside of the field is the negative, and we are on a dielectric plane in between, like a capacitor. Mm. So it's completely different than what people think. You got to remember that I don't want to say there's more ocean underneath the surface of our planet than there is on the surface of our planet. So water, rocks take in water. So if you take granite. And you put the side, just a little bit of it into the water. Water will suck up into the granite. And that's what happens under the surface of the earth. So if we ever get to the point where the gravity on earth is less and we're getting taller, which we're getting now, mm. which we go into the age of Aquarius. So it makes you wonder if gravity becomes less, the water on the earth will come up more and we'll be underwater soon. So hmm. when, when you ever watch Bernie's channel and he shows you all the videos of all these great places and how they look and the, the edges that just drop off, do yourself a favor. Take that with a grain of salt and look at it like it's underwater. Then it all starts to make sense because you hmm. have water flows that go through things. They shape the rocks. You have cavities in the wall. They're not for birds. They're for fish. And then... You could start to see exactly yeah. how the water flow tore through this place in ancient times. And then you can also see where the ground, where it looks like rocks stacked upon each other, mm -hmm. they're just funnels or vents from underneath the ocean where the actual magma and stuff was under there, putting in heat under it and having a vent pipe. So it's completely different when you look at it through a different lens. Then... Mm -hmm. You start looking, you go, okay, well, these civilizations are on high of a mountain, right? And they have spots where they can make food and stuff. Well, that doesn't make any sense until you put water all the way around it. And then you say, well, no, it makes sense, right? Now we have this, you know, tip of the earth thing. People have to live. And they sit on top of that because there's water all around them. Absolutely. Right now, now that I'm thinking about it, there are these ancient um, cities, right? And they're at the tops of these tall mountains but if you fill that, you know, cavity with water, it makes sense, you know? Yep. <laughs> then do it in reverse. Say, okay, well, let's take the water away some more. So now we get closer to where the ocean floor is more of on the surface of the earth, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can understand it where gravity must have been much stronger at the time, pulling the water back into the core of the earth. Therefore, the civilizations there were okay. You know what I mean? They were able to habitate that area. And you oh. see that, what is it, in the Bahamas or something like that, or through that area, there's a bunch of sunken cities under there. Wow. When we talk about the pyramid of Egypt and we ask what it does, I always ask the question, was it terraforming? Because any time that you have an object that pulls in energy and mm -hmm. pulls it down on the pyramid is what it's doing. It's not shooting it up. That's a misconception. The energy is coming down. And it's coming down to the pyramid. And then it makes that pyramid suck to the ground more. So is it increasing the gravity on the Earth? Is it terrible mm -hmm. our Earth in order to change the gravity? Because the pyramids are everywhere. Wow. That makes, that makes sense, too. That's something that I never heard about. But that makes sense. If it is pushing down to the surface more, it clearly has to be having some kind of gravitational effect. And that gravitational effect does affect other things in our uh, ecological systems, you know, like the water, like you said. So that's that's mind-blowing right there. So you got to think of it like this. Anytime you take the amps out of something and you put mostly volts, it becomes charged. It no longer creates a magnetic field. It creates charge. Therefore, the charge, just like any object that you put on something, like if you put tinfoil oil on the uh, countertop, 
mm-hmm. off the wood or anything, and then you hit it with electricity, it automatically sucks down because mm-hmm. it's creating charge between the surface because there's no amps and it's high voltage. No, no real amps. It's creating a charge, and there it's putting pressure. I have a little UFO experiment that I do. It, it's just a paper lifter. You put it on there, and you can get it weighs grams. You can get pounds of force out of it. Wow. Now yeah, this makes sense too. Like uh, what we see pyramids on on Mars, for instance. You know, uh, the the Earth's magnetosphere plays an important role in in forming our atmosphere and and life on this planet. So. Yeah, Mars Mars doesn't need nuclear weapons. They need a moon. Yeah. But, but they have two moons that are like asteroid catches. They literally need a big moon. It, it has to do with tidal force. If all mm-hmm. of your water is in the rock at the center of the planet, which, by the way, the Mars rover goes down, what, six inches? I mean, mm-hmm. that's pathetic. Look, <laughs> you if all the water's down there and it's condensed towards the core, right? Mm-hmm. What do you need? You need a tidal force to bring that out. You know right. what I mean? You need the water to come out like this and stay on the surface. Otherwise, it's going to stay close, sucked to the planet. The problem with Mars is it doesn't have a big enough force on the outside to pull that out. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? We get tidal force with us that brings in the water level. So if you live next to the water like I do, the water goes down, and then the boats sit there look like they're you know sitting out of water. And then the water will go back up. It, it's just the tide. You know what I mean? Completely changes something when you look at planets. Yeah. Yeah, it does. What's your opinion on the moon? Do you think it's a hollow uh, structure of some sort? You think it's, you know, it's like, manufactured? It's like Swiss cheese. Like Swiss cheese? Yeah, it probably, has a, in it. probably has a giant cavern in the center. Oh, okay. It just got giant cavities. Do you think it was formed from the asteroid belt? No. I think it's no. a capture. It's a capture. And, and, and I'll tell you why. What does that mean? It, basically, capture means that it was an object in the solar system and it came by too close to Earth and we stole it and it oh. stayed with us. And I say that because there's spots on our Earth where it has the uh, crust of the Earth and it has rings. So they're not full rings around the entire Earth, okay? Like you would expect. What are they? They're partial ones. So you get a partial here, and down here you get a partial here. Okay? Probably over here you have a partial here. The ocean floor is coming up. And they say every time they check the the record in that area, they say this was the bottom of the ocean floor at one time. There is not a force on this earth great enough to pull that. You must have a moon or something like that. Yeah, an external force. Yeah. Yeah. So if I say it's a capture, it's because it goes around, and it's like a guy swinging a hammer, okay? He Mm -hmm. extends his arms, okay, with the hammer, and as he spins, he goes in, it pulls out further at some point, and then as he spins, it pulls back in a little bit, then it pulls back out. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's causing his body to sometimes take on the gravity. Sometimes it's the actual hammer itself that pulls the gravity out. And that's exactly what a capture would do. So when you do that, it's going to leave scars on the surface of the earth where the ocean now becomes the surface of the planet in those areas. So you'll see it pull. So the story goes in cuneiform, if you look at it and read the story, is that there was a planet in between Mars and Jupiter and it got hit by something and or hit a moon or whatever the deal was, it blew up the planet and it was mostly a water planet or something like that. And then they habitated both Mars and Earth. Hmm. So they were the original, which makes sense if you look at we're in the the best zone or whatever they want to call it of where the Earth is. Up. Yeah. At one point, there would have been a planet that was there that was in that Goldilocks zone that moved out to a zone where it was no longer the Goldilocks zone, right? Mm-hmm. So that then they say, okay, there was uh, uh, people on Mars or, you know, Mars people, whatever you want to call them. It went from one planet at the Goldilocks to the next planet at the Goldilocks to our planet in the Goldilocks. The next one is uh, Venus that would show up in the Goldilocks zone. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, and it pushes the other planets outward. 
Wow. And this, yeah. I'm assuming this happens in cycles, like uh, the through the zodiac symbols. Yep. Yeah. All, all of it tied together, man. Somebody back yeah. in the day knew way more than we did. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and we just ignore them today. It's ridiculous, you no, know, or at least most people do. Check it out. It's because of the simple fact that the world undergoes a part where the water comes to the surface and wipes out humanity. Then mm -hmm. it comes back and goes down. We rehabitate everything, and then it does it again. So we only have so many years to learn things before we got to get off of this rock for a while or live in the water under it. So, right, we right, to yeah, we we're on a timer here. Yeah, so we got to figure it out, and you know, what I mean, get away or simply find a way to live with it and go underwater, right. or reactivate the pyramids to tear you terraform everything. You know, yeah, but. But things are in cycles because it has to do with planetary cycles. That's why they always look for Planet X. Right. Well, I mean, we're really close to anti-gravitics, you know. We're really close, and it's it's not going to be far off. And I know I'm going to sign you know sign me up for being the first to to go explore the solar system with you. <laughs> so. Right on. Well, you got you got a video, Ben. Uh. E let me see if I can pull something up. Yeah, I might have something. Give me one second. So um, I did have, it's not a video, but I did have um, Elijah, uh, a viewer on the other night, and he was, he's been um, sending me a lot of his uh, notes, and they're very highly detailed notes, and some of it has, you know, theories and ideas. Um, regarding some Bedini circuits and, and other free energy circuits. So uh, I wanted to take a brief look at that because I didn't get a chance to take a look at it yet. And then while I'm doing that, I will pull up a video as well for afterwards. Put that over here. All right, so I haven't actually taken a look at this yet. I don't know. Can you guys see that clear? Or should I blow it up more? Yeah, you blow up a little bit. Yeah. Let me try zooming in a little bit. There we go. All right, so I was just going to go over some of his notes because, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of um, hard to read a little bit, but uh, every once in a while he'll have like a – an idea in here in some of his notes that is fascinating. So zero point energy, see Garrett model. This is, this is all based on uh, tapping zero point energy and his theories and all that. Okay, so here we have a peg cell battery charger. And this is a diagram of his. He's highlighting the current, I believe. And let's see if he has any notes. Yep. So small peg cell standalone, 1.2 volt milliamp range, earth battery. So this is, I guess, a uh, schematics for an earth battery. Hmm. Yeah. Um, it's kind of hard to read, so I'm going to do my best here, so bear with me. Inverted dipole EMF reverses ion flow slash time in battery, question mark. Uh, you know, we're, it's probably just a question he had in his notes. You know, we all have them. Write them down. A small input energy of a few milliamps can output 100 volts um, sla uh, per amp, or is that slash amp, through the... Mm, I can't make out that word. Something of responsive via back EMF. So again, we have this, uh, this um, pattern um, of back EMF being utilized. Okay, hold on, hold on. 100 volts over M... So over oh, millivolts, or milliamps. It says 100 volts and then sl slash amp or one amp, something like that, right here. It's over milliamps. Oh, it's over milliamps? Yeah. Ah, uh, okay, so that's, okay. Because he's talking about flyback circuits, so it's uh, high voltage, low, low amperage. Okay, yeah, the scan, he, he did say the scans are a little low quality, so I apologize. Uh, he says, I have witnessed this in Joel Lagasse. 
Lagis YouTube channel. Uh, we can use Earth's electrostatic potential of 100 volts. Milla, yeah, I think you're right. Milliamps. Well, of course you're right. Yeah, that's why I have you on on with me to to teach me. <laughs> but uh, anyways, um, he says you can use the Earth's electrostatic potential of 100 volts uh, with altitude to supply back EMF to enable quantum tunneling of electrons in the PEG cell. Furthermore, EMF interference can create virtual um, parentheses need particles to decay into DC as seen in Garrett's model, work with oscillator um, uh, to create virtual zero point energy. So that's all fascinating. Um, he's got some really detailed notes here with all well, the was, was he talking about an antenna there? Uh, when you were talking about that, because I thought he was talking, you were talking about atmosphere. Was that did I hear that right? Um, I don't, I don't know. Honestly, he said we can use Earth's electrostatic potential of 100 volts with altitude to supply back EMF to enable quantum tunneling of electrons in the pixel. Yeah. So with an antenna, altitude, so, yeah. so it's altitude. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that that's a good catch there. I didn't even catch that. Thank you. Um, well, it's like Badini says, you put two poles out, put a wire across the pole, and they'll pick up energy. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with an antenna. Hmm. And and it's and it's in potential form. It's not AC or DC. Again, AC and DC are man-made. This is in potential form, so it's Earth energy. You can here. You can see his diagram um, describing the Casimir cavity, as he calls it. Um, on a, uh, I believe this is on a quantum scale. He's creating like this Casimir effect type effect. It's like a, a, a different type of, uh, or a different way of obtaining the Casimir effect rather than just putting two, you know, plates real close to each other. I, I could be wrong, but he was describing using the Casimir effect in, in the actual circuit in a different way. Well, let's say, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh. Uh, uh, was that aluminum, silicone, silicon, oxygen? Uh, palladium, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, he's, he's making a battery. Yeah, and quantum tunneling, same thing. Uh, Mike Faraday was talking about he was doing with his battery. Yeah, it's putting and them together. Field battery too, right? Yeah, it's putting them together to ca cause a reaction without any moving parts or anything injected into it. That's normally what one of these batteries is. And it uses quantum tunneling. But if he's saying he can use it by energizing and putting something into it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He expects the output to be higher. Now, there, right. it's a cold energy. When you're talking about high volts and low amps, it's mm -hmm. considered the cold side of energy, not the hot side, because hot side comes with amps. So he's definitely got something going on there that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I told him, uh, you know, I'm not um, uh, certified to check his math by any <laughs> means. <laughs> but, uh, I'll you know, I'll do my best in trying to relay some of this information for him and, you know, going over some of it with the audience. Well, he's talking about structures here. Mm -hmm. Right yeah, here. I always had a market. dream about structures, man. Always. <clears throat> oh, check this out right here. It's uh, some kind of molecule. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for it because he's probably taking, I'm trying to see, because he looks like a crystalline structure or something's going on there. Yeah. Quartz. SiO2 quartz. There you go. The movement creates electrostatic charge, assisting lift. Hexagonal microstructure teleports electrons down like with Garrett's model work Thus, assisting lift. See something work. Um, it's kind of faded out there. Wiring is, and then that's faded too. Back EMF, one wire circuit. Uh, Grab, uh, Grab, 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 Yeah, his uh, um, he's he's referred uh, he's referring to Grabinikov right here. That's what's scratched out. He he has it written over here. Okay. And if you don't know who uh, Grabinikov is, I believe he's the, the the guy who was working with the Beatles, right? 
Yeah, working with the Beatles, he also made the uh, box where you could put a rock on top of it, and it would just lift off. Mm. So, wow. Take if you if we have a chance, take a Brennikoff's work, and I, and I'll try to make a video of this where it lifts off, and mm. then watch Hutchinson's lift off of his stuff. They're eerily similar. You can literally put them next to each other, and you'll see them lift off the same way. And they both have a rotational spin to them. Okay? Right. It's absolutely brilliant. It, it nullifies any stupid person with some orange little ball on a string. It, it tells you conclusively they're making them the same way. You know what I mean? Right. It's, right. It, 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 it proves the theory without you even knowing they were connected. Two people, two different places, two different things. But they do the same thing exactly. So we have a, a, a um, viewer who is asking, what is the peg cell? I know the meg cell, but not the peg. And I'm honestly not familiar with it myself. So what we're going to do now is ask Leonard Bot, which is my always uh, always my favorite go-to. Um, well, AI guys, action? <laughs> yeah. You guys can access Leonard Bot too. Um, it's L-E-N-R-Bot.com. I'm going to put it in the chat. And it stands for Low Energy Nuclear Reactions. And it was designed by some of the anonymous affiliates at the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project uh, community. And it was designed to help people with their questions on zero-point energy and all the obscure areas of science that we talk about. And uh, we're going to ask him, what is the peg cell? And as you can see... Um, he will give us a bunch of timestamps and, and links to different websites uh, if, if it's relevant. Um, but what right now, we're just going to ask him to summarize it, the answer with AI. All right. So he says the PEG cell is an experimental cell structure that involves pairs of superfluid vortices with curved sections within the superfluid structure. The cells exhibit a curved surface and form geometric sections potentially related to the structure of an itonic cluster, which is just a, a charged cluster, or Ken Scholler's charged clusters. Uh, the experimental cell design consists of a glass jar with a uh, bake light lid, and research is ongoing to understand the structure and behavior of these cells further. So that's that's interesting. Thank you, Leonard Bot. Let me uh, bring them down here. So that's uh, that's the peg cell. Um, if you have any further questions, you can access Leonard Bot today for free. <laughs> and I highly suggest you check him out. He's pretty cool. So oh, there's me... a guy that does a lot of videos, Ben, uh, for the peg cell out there. And I, I honestly haven't watched him a lot. But let me see where it is. I'll pull up the yeah, guy's if you got channel. Something... Yeah, if you got something, let's pull it up. So, uh, give me one second. I'll be right back. Okay. Where is it? Let's see if this one is it. So, share the screen here. Sorry, guys. Give me just a second. Experiment that turned out to work very well. I tried to use the peg cell as a reactive X electrode. So basically, as I've been doing with some previous videos, I've demonstrated and talked about the importance of reactive power and what it can do and what it cannot do. So watch previous videos if you don't understand what I mean about building a capacitive power supplies and all the benefits into doing that. So I figured, hey, since this is an electrode, it's got capacitive properties and it, it's um, self regaging it would be good for a reactive power supply so it could drop my current because we always need a trigger folks there's no free lunch but we need a little bit of real power to maintain our dipoles and run our switches and that sort of thing but apart from that uh, the whole point is to use as less real power as possible without introducing so much resistance and heat. So the reactive power supplies is a good solution to bring the current down without wasting it all in resistance and heat. So not only does this peg cell work excellent at doing that, but it also works at contributing maybe a milliamp or so of that current. So it contributes as well and limits 
our current input to a workable levels that we want. So what I did is this is basically just driving a regular AC to DC 12 volt power supply. This 12 volt power supply scaled really down with the reactive power running only at milliamps thanks to the PEG cell is going into um, this high voltage, high frequency um, generator here for neons and whatnot. And it's charging a series of capacitors, a total of 28 UF at 1000 volts. When it reaches the 1000 volts level, it triggers this 1000 volt gas charge, this charge tube that energizes the high voltage side of a microwave transformer. So we're dumping what's unusual and different here in my previous videos, I would dump, you know, the high current, low voltage, uh, sorry, the high voltage, low current into the capacitor and get the uh, amps that way. What I'm doing here is I'm getting the, still the amps, but charging it really, really quick at high frequency, high voltage. So I could discharge the high current high voltage and discharge on the high voltage side so that I get a much lower but higher current um, output secondary side, so about 100 volts. So that 100 volts right now goes to the output of a charger. But to show you the demonstration, I got a large capacitor to drive a motor. To show you, my point is how it's very nice to be able to use very low current drives to be able to generate high current pulses with the help of transformers and capacitors. But I'm kind of doing like the Tesla thing, but in reverse, you know. It's really, really effective in reverse as well, if you know what you're doing. So on top of that, during the discharge spike, I take the inductive kickback with the reverse diode and send this into the high voltage side of a, um, which would be the primary high voltage side of another AC transformer. And I scale because it's a really big spike at a thousand volts. You could just imagine, you know, when you do a couple volts, you get like 24. So this is a big, big spike, but still an inductive kickback. So I make it more manageable with this transformer, which steps it down to about 24 volts. And I rectify the secondary lower voltage. And that's also an additional system that goes back into the charging. So what I'm doing is I'm also recovering the spike from the generated burst. So we've got a few mechanisms at work and it works very well. So I drew up a schematic for to help folks understand here. The lighting is bad. Let's see if I can change the angle a bit here. But this is the PEG cell battery charger. So the PEG cell here acts as your reactive and it's a limiter. So you get milliamps limited output. This goes into a small DC transformer, just enough to drive the high voltage neon transformer. There's the high voltage cap dump. And I will pose the schematic at the end of the video. Just wanted to show you this. So now the whole point is really cool. So I'm gonna plug this in to the mains here. You could use, my whole idea too was to try and build an efficient uh, battery charger. I wanna charge my battery eventually down the line with this, with the mains, cause that's what I have here. But I'm sure you could use an inverter or anything else, but it's just convenient for me. So I'm going to plug this in and I'll show you these cap dumps. It takes a few moments to, to charge. There you go. Let's see right away the motor spins. I don't know if there's any battery left in here. So we get really high current bursts when it does kick in. 81 milliamps. Because these are serious discharges. But it's... This is smoothing out a big capacitor, but I'm just showing you what little, little, and this is what's going on here. Um, there's the spark gap discharging every few seconds because it's very low current, but it's a very, very high burst because of this energizer here. A thousand volts discharges at 28 UF through the spark gap going into the microwave transformer, giving you 110 volts high current bursts. And this is what we're doing. And here I've got the scope on the inductive kickback to show you the recycling of the spike. And we get about 20 some, if I can catch it here. Takes a moment to get, it's very sharp. 
There you go, 27 volts there. But it's very sharp. My scope doesn't catch it every time here. If I can change the resolution a bit here. There you go. There's that spike. So that's about 28 volts. And we recover the inductive kickback plus the discharge here. And this runs nice and cool and also contributes to the system. So all in all, a pretty good system, I would say. And I hope with the help of the circuit diagram, it helps you understand. Now, something maybe I should say for another day, which I haven't done here, but because I'm not planning to use the motor, but if you take the one of the inputs, like let's say the plus of the motor that goes in here and put it to the primary of another transformer, on the secondary, you'll read like, I was reading close to 100 volts of RF just coming in. So I could use that as an additional system and re-gauge back in, but I'm not really uh, looking into building uh, generators right now. But if this were to spin another generator, you see what I'm getting at, recycle the RF as well into an LC circuit. But for now, this is gonna go into a battery instead, but I just want to show you those discharges, which are working very well for a very, very little milliamp input here, thanks to the PEG cells reactive stage. So I hope you understand, and I will post this circuit diagram at the end of my video, so you all can see what I'm doing here. And again, I must emphasize, no free lunch, folks. We have to put in a little bit of real power to maintain our diodes, our, di our dipoles, and run our switching and our power supplies. All can be very low current, and we let the capacitors generate the higher current discharges through the various mechanisms. So something else I want to do down the line here is set up another tap with a one wire. I'm not even interacting with that yet. That's another whole system. That could charge another 100 volts additionally, a few capacitors, and then put that back into the system. But one thing at a time. This is pretty cool, I think, anyways. Really recycling every part of that spike back and front, basically. Had minimal losses. Wow, so that's a peg battery cell. Well, it was a circuit, but the peg cell was just a little cell that he showed the big tube. Mm -hmm. Give me a minute. I'll, I'll pull this down. And then I'll just see if there's an individual uh, peg cell. Sure. So go ahead and take it for a minute, Ben, and I'll be right back. Yeah, uh, this will be a good segue into our sponsor segment. I'm contractually obligated by Lenny, uh, uh, Lenny Bot, um, to do a, se a sponsor segment um, for myself. So uh, if you aren't aware, we have a merch uh, shop on Streamlabs. Hey, Gerald. So our merch shop uh, has a wide variety of fun merchandise that you can buy and help support the channel Beneficence TV and my research. Uh, right now I'm wearing the Legends of Renewable Energy t-shirt. As you can see, it has Marco Rodin, it has Jordan Collin from Alchemical Science, it has Malcolm Bendel and Randy Powell and the Thunderstorm Generator. And also we have the Benefactor Beverage Containment Unit for all your beverage needs. It keeps it hot, it keeps it cold, ice not included. That's all I got. Look Are you guys it. shutting it down? Is that what the idea was? The what? Were you shutting no, it no, down? No, no, I'm, you, okay. No, so I'm we're, just, I'm we're just, talking about the peg cell. Do you know anything oh, about yeah. it? Yeah, Joel Legacy's peg cell. Yeah, yeah, we're watching a video where you use it. Can you explain the peg cell? It's kind of like turning DC into AC. Well, not really. It's a it's a system he uses that has capacitance that flips the pole. It's very interesting the way he's using it. He's not using it as a battery. He's more using it as a capacitive link that uh, that flips the pole in his circuit. At least that's the way I understand it from the way he was explaining it. Okay. So, uh, 
I don't know. He's using the peg, which is uh, polyethylene glycol, and then he's mixed a little bit of carbon with it, from my understanding. And then I don't know what else. But well, it's go ahead. I have a video if you want to see it. Yeah, if sure, if you want to throw it up. I've seen most of his videos, but by all means, let's break it down to address them as good as I can. But sometimes, you know, in the comments, it can get pretty messy. And there's been some repeated questions, so I'll try and um, get the most out of it. So um, a lot of people want to build the peg cells, and they want to know what works best, what doesn't work. So um, the main ingredient is the, um, what I use is the peg electrolyte as the solace. And it's this stuff here. In Canada, it's Restorolax, okay? It's this right here. Mm -hmm. And the ingredients here is, people are asking for the active ingredients because you have to have 100% poly, poly, I have a hard time with that word there, but it's 100% uh, polyethylene glycol 3350. And here it is right there. So that's all it is. And sometimes some of this stuff in other countries has medical medicinal ingredients that mix into this and it's not good. It, it nullifies the effect. So you have to be very careful that it's 100% peg, okay? Now, this stuff here is pretty expensive, folks. And what I've realized is here in Canada, there's another in, um, it's called Option Plus at Guardian Drugstore. It's essentially the same thing at half the price. Obviously the same company because they're literally identical, but um, different label. But the same thing here, the same composition. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, so now you want to know how to um, prepare this. So people were asking about the composition. And um, because, obviously, I have all these different cells, I never came up with quite a standard for it, but I'll give you some pointers on how it happens. So let's say I want to mix this little cell's worth. So maybe a few spoons of PEG electrolyte, and I would mix that with a few drops of hot water. Now, what seems to work best is when it becomes melted into like a translucent paste, okay? Yeah. Like an oily translucent paste. What happens is if it's too uh, thick, like, like um, very pasty, when it dries out, it tends to get chalky and break apart. If it's too watery, it just doesn't really dry out. So you got to get that perfect pace you'll see what i mean once you start constructing them so i found out just a few drops of water hot water by the way and later on i found out that it was easier to just use an old pot at low heat and just melt that all in there so optionally i've you could build the peg cell with just the peg and it will work the the um, electrodes magnesium and um, conductive carbon but I've experimented with various, um, you, could, uh, you could substitute the magnesium with a, um, with a aluminum foil, and it does the same thing. You could use zinc and copper if you don't have um, conductive carbon and magnesium. You got about the same thing. So that's about as far as I took it with uh, experimenting with different electrodes. Now, obviously, you're going to want to make sure your cell dries. You could take a few days, test the continuity to make sure there's no measurable resistance. We've discussed in previous videos, always going to have the moisture of the air and whatnot. So there's always, even if the meter can't measure it, there's still that minute amount of it. So um, not really relevant, but just to put it out there, of course, you know. So uh, the important part is that the meter has no continuity and even at the highest range, it doesn't measure a resistance. It's a good indicator that they're properly as isolated as they can get anyways. So that's a big part of it is to keep your electrodes isolated for proper operation. 
Now, of course, as soon as you pour this in, you'll get a voltage. So as it is wet, you could say it's a traditional galvanic effect. We don't want this. So we want to wait for it to dry and we want to use electrodes that are non-corrosive so we could withstand that temporary effect so there's no um, corrosion or very minimal during the drying process. Once it's dry, obviously there won't be corrosion influence by that, not any more so than being in the natural environment from natural moisture in the air. So in other words, it has the potential to last a lot of years if you build them properly. So um, this is actually the first, one of the first cells that I, was, that I experimented with. And it still puts out, you know, this was done in the winter time. And if I put the voltmeter here, I don't know if you guys are going to see that, but I'm just going to measure it now. 1.01 volts. So it's still putting out over a volt. This has been in my closet forever, just stored there. And this blue stuff here was an experiment. I tried to use the, uh, instead of mixing the peg with um, a drop of water, I had that concentrated um, syrup, electrolyte sports drink. That's why it's blue. It smells like Kool-Aid. <laughs> I wouldn't eat it though. So that All right, guys, that's pretty much your understanding of what's going on. Yeah. Um, I'm still yeah. not when, when you're making the, maybe we can kind of summarize it a little bit. I tried making a peg cell and I got I can't even remember what I got out a half volt or something and I just threw it aside. But when you're making them, make sure you wear gloves because the same the stuff's a laxative and it soaks into your oh. skin. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought you guys should all look <laughs> That's so funny. Right? Rest relax. Oh. <laughs> that was skipping for me. I don't know if it's skipping for you guys. It might be my internet, though. Not skipping here. No, that's skipping here. It's uh, got to be your internet. Is it going to crash yeah. again on you, Ben? No, honestly, I with Streamlabs, I don't think it'll crash because the the overhead is being um, taken care of, you know, by Streamlabs, and it's not, I don't have any resources on my computer that it's okay. needing. StreamYard? Also. Nice. Uh, yeah, so, sorry, StreamYard, yeah. It, you, you get the idea, right? Like, there's nothing from my computer. Like, with Streamlabs, it was an app on the computer pulling resources from my computer and then oh. broadcasting them. So this is kind of doing the work for my computer, and honestly... You're right. You know, I'm a little stubborn when it comes to changing my ways a little bit because I get too comfortable with my my uh, programs and stuff. But uh, you, you sometimes I need a little push, and and that's that's exactly what I needed here because stream streamer just definitely taking care of all of the needs I need for the stream. Um, well, it's allowing me to organize everything. Uh, you know, view the chats, highlight them. You know, give people credit when they need it. You know, on the chat, and it's it's very convenient. I love it. You know what the gurus of old used to say, eh? Life begins just outside your comfort zone. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. I'm yeah, never you know, there's, so. and there is a theory that and there's a theory that and uh they did scientific studies on this that people are actually most productive when they're slightly uncomfortable. You know, you have to find yeah. that balance. You know, you can't be completely comfortable or else you're just going to get a little lazy, I guess is the idea. But, uh, you know, being a little bit off balance, being a little bit, you know, like I, I need to manage my time here, you know, kind of snaps you into focus, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're not wrong. That's it took funny. me a while to get out of bed today, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was maybe 5.30, 6 o'clock, I started to get out of bed. Crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I mean, you to focus. I was a little more off balance today than normal. <laughs> You're in a lot of pain, so it's understandable too. You know, that throws you off. It is. Not so bad right now, but earlier was really bad. Yeah. Well, I'm, that's I'm glad life, you're right? doing better. Yeah. Hey, man, I appreciate it. I do. It's just life, though. I'll just pick up again tomorrow and start fresh. Another day. Right? That's right. Yeah. I don't let it get me down. It just it just pauses me for a day here and there, right? 
<laughs> right. Yeah, that's about what it does. Yeah, yeah, you get it. You understand. Yeah, I, I, I had gout for like a month, and it would travel mm. from my foot to my knee to my back, and then it went over to my hand. My hand was puffed up like completely for about two weeks. I couldn't work, couldn't move it, couldn't do oh, anything. Wow. And it was just all in the joint. So yep. the joint crystals would just gr grow. And then it hurt. You couldn't touch it. You couldn't bang it. It felt like a broken bone every time you came around it. Just awful. I hear yeah. that. That sucks. Mine's in the neck because my head went through the windshield not once but twice. Mm. Two different accidents, eh? So the first time I, I went to physio and I got it all back and it was good. Second time, it, the physio didn't take as well. <laughs> it is what it is. I'm happy to just be walking, talking, and alive. <laughs> I got yeah. uh, four screws and two plates and a little ball bearing where my disc used to be in my lower back. Oof. Yeah, it hurts. I have a feeling that medical advancements will uh, will get really exciting in the next you know few years as long as we try to push this this new science out or this old yeah. science. Rather. Well, it's not going to help me now. Now, <laughs> no, no, but, a little bit of robotics, a little bit of yeah, license to parts yeah. might help out. The problem that I see is that we're kind of heading towards uh, um, like a cyberpunk uh, dystopia where people are going to want to augment themselves, right? <laughs> Yeah, not for me. I want to go all natural. It's written. Yeah, that exactly. Have, yeah, it's written that we have a a form of evolution that most people don't want to even consider, and it's directly connected to light and energy and sound. And I think that that's our next stage. I think that's where we should be headed. Don't get me wrong. I want to build a ship, but I mean, if I could fly, <laughs> who wouldn't want it, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, so that's where my head's at. Will I ever accomplish it? Who knows? If I don't, maybe some of the info or all the info that I have can get carried on to someone else and they can complete the task <laughs> one mm. step at a time, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. if you, if you, if you make, if a, make a surprise utility belt so nobody comes around knows what you're doing and they <laughs> put it on thinking it's a belt or something like play. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be, that'd be hilarious. Uh, <laughs> if I, yeah, if I, if I, I, I'm building something that I don't. I, I've brought it up before, but it, it's kind of really cool. It has to go with PEMF healing, pulse electromagnetic frequency healing, and it's a watch. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. Oh, nice. And it just goes That's... on your wrist. You can wear it for 15 minutes out of the day, for like seven to 14 days, depending on the treatment. And I, I can see it now. You yeah. got a kid that's into LARPing and they go out with their buddies and they put on your utility belt thinking <laughs> it was a cool accessory. They start flying over with their sabers <laughs> and start whacking people. Be or they disappear the where they're standing. <laughs> you never know. Man. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. That's that hilarious. would be fun. <laughs> that would be fun. This has been a long stream. I think this is the longest I've ever been on. Uh, yeah, I meant today to be because I wanted to like I'm inching towards um 1,000 views, so yeah, our 1,000 subscribers. No, no, I'm sorry, 1,000 subscribers, 4,000 views, um, watch hours. So um, I'm trying to close the cap there with this stream. Uh, hey, Gerald, so you're trying to do a, yeah, go ahead. Are you typing things out for all of us? <laughs> you know what? I don't know how that's working. <laughs> that little that little button on the left. I guess the all. Yeah, you know what? I typed out one thing. All of a sudden, I'm seeing three, and I'm like, "Wait a second. Suddenly, I see that I love everybody. Yeah, I didn't. Put that. <laughs> but that's funny. Like, I don't it's know. It's okay. It happened to it happened to both of us. <laughs> yeah. First time I did it, I'm like, wait a second. That was me, not Nathan. And I, I fixed it, but yeah. I kept doing it. I did it the same I thing. I was like, what, 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 what's going on? <laughs> well, now we all disappeared. What happened? Oh, my God. Oh, there you go. So, so yeah, I realized you after, though. 
It's that little for, button on for the, the left. For right the board. chat who who needs yeah, a little yeah, context well, here, StreamYards yeah. has an option where we can uh, chat for everybody or individuals. So we accidentally had that. <laughs> so I was speaking oh. for Ben and, and Nathan here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Some it's okay. Stuff coming up. Nathan's going, what's going on? He <laughs> says, I love you all. And I'm like, hey. so I like do we get I hacked? Is that like a mental thought? <laughs> <laughs> Gerald just put it out for everybody. Oh, that's funny. Oh, this looks like some electrolysis going oh, yeah, on that, here, huh? That's Bernie stuff, isn't it? Yeah. I've been wanting to get back into my hydrogen research. It's just time. There's so many things I'm doing. I can't add that to the list. I eventually probably will. I'm not doing what he's doing, though. What I was doing was totally different. He does long-term. That's long-term transmutation through uh, the production of HHO. Yeah. Yeah. Me, I was just breaking water and lighting it on fire. <laughs> it was fun. I thought, you know what? Implosions, let's see how far I can go before it actually scares me a little bit. Yeah. And the last one I did scared me a little bit. And I haven't done it since because I let the bubbles go for a while. And then I lit it and it imploded so hard. I felt it in my chest. My windows of my house shook. Oh, it's crazy. Lighting hydrogen is insane. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, it is. So you got to do it fast when it comes out. Keep the bubbles small. Don't let them get too big. Oh, because that's when you have problems. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I was heavy in the hydrogen in the beginning. That was uh, when I was watching. Did you guys ever hear of a guy named Russ Grease? RWD yeah. Research. Yep. Yep. I heard he did a lot of different research everywhere. He did the water yeah. cell. He also did it in Medini. He also did the coils like you're working on. Yeah. He did a lot of different stuff. He did. He did a lot of rodent and he did he actually built the EPG. And and I don't know if he's ever gonna hear this or listen to this. I don't know. But it was weird. He built it, he had all the components, everything, and then nothing. You hear nothing about it. I think you got a phone call and someone told him to back off personally, but I can't prove that and I've never asked him. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to talk to him in the comment section all the time. I even emailed him a couple times in the beginning. But yeah, he built a beautiful EPG. And and that's that big uh it's like a toroid, but it's three eighths or half inch copper tubing. It wraps in a in three, and then it's copper coils wrapped around many different copper coils wrapped around that, and then it's pulsed with a magnetic gas, suppose a magnetic gas, right? And then you pick up the the um, power from the pickup coils. Well, when Stan Meyer had it going, there's a story out there that says. Uh, well, Stan Meyer was talking about it in that basement lecture I'm going to try and find for you. When he started the EPG, everything was going good. He he had power running, and he left it running in the garage, went into the house or something, and then all of a sudden they heard this big boom, and it was like the sound barrier was broken or something. Mm. And uh, he went ran out to the garage and shut it down, and apparently it had shook in his whole house and the neighbors all heard it and he never turned it back on. <laughs> That's the way the story goes. Anyway, you'll, you'll see him tell it in that video. I'm going to get that. It's like an hour, 10 minutes. But yeah, that was something I wanted to ask you. I haven't been able to put out videos longer than 15 minutes. So I don't know if that's a thing that I have to do with YouTube Yes. Or it is? It's something uh, I'm missing? You have to go into your settings of YouTube. Yeah. And you have to verify your, I believe it's your phone number. And oh, yeah. verify yeah. your email. Yeah. And once you've done that, you can unlock it. And then all you have to do is click it to uh, say that you want it available. Ah, 
Okay, I'll have to go back into that. Yeah, the verification process. Yeah, so going through the studio, when you go into YouTube, go in the studio for YouTube. Yeah. And from there, go into settings. And then yeah. it'll bring up your personal settings and stuff like that. But you switch it in there. Okay. Okay. I'll do that later for sure. Now, then I can put that video up. Go ahead. That it allows you for your live streams though, right, right now, right? Oh, yeah. I can put my live streams out. But that's different than doing like an hour-long video and putting that out. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know why, but like you yeah, said. Yeah, that's how you really trigger the algorithm. It's yeah. Longer videos. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Is that what no, you meant? no, no, not not necessarily longer, but just put more attention and detail into them. You know, put a little more love into them, and you know, you can trigger the algorithm a little bit more. Yeah, like I said, I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna trigger the algorithm. Hey, look, we're all good at something. Just understand yeah. this. I'm good at looking at something and knowing what's going on before everybody in the room realizes it. Okay. Nice. And then I can take a look at what you're looking at and specifically find that little part that makes it work. Okay. Yeah. That's what I can do. Not I know, I've seen the it. other stuff, but I know exactly where to look. So you talk about a contract, I can find your way out of a contract. You talk about how to trigger an algorithm, I can figure it out. You want to do yeah. hardcore mathematics, give me a few minutes and I'll show you. You know what I mean? What you want to do. It's very easy. Math is so easy, dude. It's changing the letter for a number. That's it. Yeah, no, I get that part. I don't know why. But I it's confused. it's true. But that's it. It's all a formula. And all you have to it's do is change true. the formula. In our group of Avengers, you're Captain America for sure. <laughs> I, don't know about, I don't know about that. Maybe a little bit of Winter Soldier or something. Who knows? <laughs> there you go. I'm the new smart Hulk. <laughs> no, I've learned more from Nathan in the last, you know, few weeks than I ever have, you know, from any uh, official like mainstream YouTuber who's, you know, like yep. denying free energy exists, you know? Well, again, all those PhDs and MP3s, all those guys that are out there stating that they have all these credentials and they know all these things that can help so many people. I don't hear them teaching nothing. But I've yeah. learned more from Nathan the last month than I have from a lot of people, we'll say, in the last three years. Mm -hmm. And that blows my mind because those people know exactly what the heck I was talking about. And they know exactly what I was doing, but didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. Well, some of the Thanks. times they get to the edge of their research and they don't know what's beyond it. Because remember, we blow things up to prove the point. So... <laughs> to make sure we know where the limit is. And if That's you don't true. do that, you'll never find the special parts of anything. Never. Never. I've blown a lot of stuff up. Like I've you said, you coils. Gotta, gotta be a little bit uncomfortable. Yep. <laughs> Life or, begins just outside that comfort zone, man. Or, or if you walk into the garage room and there's high voltage going on, make <laughs> sure you stand away from me. I got an experiment I want to try with... Uh, with grounding remember we were talking about grounding earlier and then mike cut me off kind of thing <laughs> he gets excited i like mike <clears throat> but uh <laughs> yeah i want to ground a plate and then i want to put the coil above my head and i want to ground the coil to the plate and just see what happens you're inside the capacitor yeah just in the grounding well i'll be standing on the ground plate and the coil will be above my head and I'm going to run 432 hertz just to see what happens. 432, the magic number. You're doing that special frequency right there. There you go. <laughs> hey, when I hurt my toe, I tried to pulse uh, my coil, my rodent coil at 432. And, you know, I put it on the toe for, you know, a few minutes to see if it would help. Well, no, I don't know I... Go ahead. Put two cameras, one close, one far away, in case you turn into a ball of light like <laughs> I want to make you catch it. Poof. No. <laughs> I'll do it live. He <laughs> said, so what happened to what happened to the benefactor? <laughs> yeah. Have you seen him that, lately? <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Or you'll just see me sit there shaking. I don't know. But it'll be a fun experiment, right? 
like I said, I've, I've this thing when it's running, I've grabbed it, and you're not really supposed to grab a transformer while it's running. But I mean, I'm not worried in that way. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I'm crazy. Hey, just a little bit of advice: never follow his lead on that. No, no, <laughs> never use, use the two pocket never. rule. <laughs> this, this, this is a warning to the public: do not uh, try this at home, and do not follow what I do because. Yeah. Most people shouldn't. <laughs> you, you put you put a case around that thing. Go find you a plastic bowl. Put it over it. Something. You stay away from that. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, I'm going to try some crazy experiments this year. My Taking God, it to the man. next level. I want to see that. Be, yeah. For it'd, sure. it'd be like the, the the Ark of the Covenant. You you see this right here, and you see Gerald in the center. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I saw That'll God's make... face. No, it was just Gerald. Hey, it'll make for a good <laughs> live, though. It'll make for a good live. <laughs> we'll see if we can make that sucker go viral. <laughs> we oh, have that's to. Awesome. One of our free energy videos has to go viral. It has to, you know? That's the way we succeed, and I'm trying hey, real hard. Hey, Ben, it won't go viral if you call it free energy. It's, yeah, it, it won't. It, that you accidentally slip the fact that it's doing something without saying anything is a better chance than telling people what it's doing. No, you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely right. And that's something that I have to consider myself for sure. Or, or you're amazed that it's happening when it's happened. Although you just did the experiment before you turned the camera on. I know guys that do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? This is live. I've never seen this before. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, okay. But they did it 10 minutes ago to make sure it happened. Before they put it on camera, I used to do that right. right in the beginning, and I went, you know what? That's kind of cheesy. I'm just gonna do shit yeah. live. Yeah, <laughs> that's you why you see wanna... mistakes when I'm doing videos. I'll be like, ah, but... oh, sorry about that. <laughs> and we were just talking about this earlier. You don't want to be gimmicky. You want to be honest uh, and and truthful and upfront with what you're doing yeah. because at the end of the day, we're trying to disseminate inf important information. You know, we don't want to belittle what we're doing. You know, or, yeah, exactly. or uh, undercut exactly. it by any way. Oh my god, dude! I should make a blooper reel of all the time I got shocked on camera. <laughs> it would go viral. I'm telling you. I mean, yeah, I would watch it. That's for sure. I mean, I we should put a blooper of all of ours in one. <laughs> I, I don't. Crazy. I don't know how to take out all the cuss words yet, because yeah. there's a lot of them that follow you when you get shot. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. I can swear like a sailor. <laughs> Especially if it's 110. Ooh, it's got a bit oh. of a bite. Yeah, it's not the 110 that bothers me. It's it's the voltage multiplier that hit me in both hands. Oh, oh. yeah. My brain just went, blah, 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 just by hearing that. Yeah, that's, I, <laughs> I sat down and rethought my life and thought if I was really doing something special or something very bad to myself. Yeah, is this really worth it? Because that thought goes through your head after getting shocked like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's worth it, though. Oh, hold on. Bernie's doing something over there. He's got something else going on. Bernie? Yeah, Crypto's got some he's moving something in the background. I don't know if he's still on the live over there with them or if he's with us. So I he sent a Apex. message in private chat. He said, um, I'm here just also at Apex Zoom, and I just told him whenever he wants to just hop on. Okay. Um, he said, crazy stuff being presented at Apex right now. I'll hop over and, and unmute in uh, 15 minutes. Yeah, I bet you there's crazy stuff being presented at Apex. It's kind of funny how it's all presented after it presented my or didn't present mine. Can you Coincidence, hear me now? I guess. Mm. I better not be the same Can stuff. Can you hear me? Oh, we, it, yeah. did, you, did you take a look? Is it the yeah. Same stuff? So I can't. I can't see. Go ahead. I was, was just turning. Let somebody pull it up then. Who, who's talking? Collecting That's some Bernie. Of That's Bernie. Go ahead, Bernie. Uh, yeah. So. I'm just uh, collecting stuff out of this jar and putting yeah. it in this jar. And then I'm going to try to get 
this electrode out that is iron in the middle and it should like right in here uh, have some very similar crystals to what uh, Bendini had going on but uh, first I'm collecting off of this zinc anode the white zinc monoatomics uh, that formed in the cloud and harvesting it into this jar. Nice. I want to see experiments done with that stuff for sure. Yeah. Right. Get, get some live results. Yeah. Stick it under a great big arc. Very nice Great work, bark, Bernie. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And well, it's a lever focus. I don't know. The light. light's not working well today. I'd love to put it in between two capacitor plates and and make it just a static charge in there and mm -hmm. see, see what it sticks to or how it forms when you put static electricity on it. Oh, because yeah. At some point, you're going to have to form layers on the outside of the UFO, one for insulation, one that separates the layers, and then the outside layers. So you're going to have to find a way to combine it. If this goes into a paste and it gets uh, activated by any form of electricity with little amps, I wonder if we can use that. You know what I mean? And if it creates Dude. some kind of crystalline structure on the inside. Like a oh, sound. Yeah. You're going to want to coat several layers uh, with these different monoatomic materials. Yeah, because it's like growing crystals inside of two different, uh, uh, two different plates. It's exactly what we want. Exactly. I wonder if he can mix that with peg cell, how that would turn out. Hmm. So yeah. as I'm pulling this guy up, you can see this black crystalline stuff right there. Mm -hmm. And it just fell off a bunch, but there's still some on. But interesting. I'm going to need two hands to try to get it out in one piece. Oh, it will come out. There we go. So most of it has fallen off, but uh, right in here is black crystal stuff. I'm gonna try to harvest it out of the jar next, but seems to be pretty much identical to what. Um, Bendini had just not as large a scale. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's interesting. And Makes then, my like, brain. Oh, there's red crystal stuff there. Interesting materials. Yeah, I want to see tests with that. Yeah. The possibilities could yeah, be. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. And then in the middle, Which one of those are you going to drink? See the monoatomic uh, layer. One of those, God. That's how you die pretty quick. Probably in one shot. Hmm. Maybe. Uh, are you going to drink the middle sick. one? Is that going to turn into water that's drinkable or potable? Uh, yeah. That. So that one, yes. The the monoatomic. Atomic uh, zinc there in the center once it's properly flushed. And first, I always try it out uh, growing on plants uh, before ever consuming mm. any myself. Right? There you go. Don't, don't want to just yeah, go straight to human guinea pig. <laughs> no, that's very smart. Very, no, no, it's very true. You don't want to test it on yourself before you test it on some plants. I tested it on plants and it grew, they grew more. But hopefully, I'm not going to get bigger than this. <laughs> Maybe this way. I don't know. 
is a little shop of horrors. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Feed me, Gerald. Feed yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> I get the reference. Yeah. So I, I didn't uh, use gloves like a dumbass. So I've got a bunch of nanomaterial on my fingers that I got to oh. wash off. Yeah, you're gonna hurry up. Yeah. Is every time I do that, it's like when you go to touch any metal, you get like wild static shocks to like the fingers and hands and stuff. It's nice. Weird. Huh. I'd love to use that for a picture. So. Yeah. You know what I'd love to do? I want to get a spear, right, that I can fill with water and have quartz in the center. And all I want to do is hit it with piezoelectricity burst. You know what I mean? Oh, all, all, You know what I mean? Just at different angles and see what it does. I want to see if I can activate the crystal inside. Put it between two plates with two rods going to the outside so you have a flow where you can capture the energy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, as soon as it amplifies in there, the water's carrying the voltage and stuff and let it pull through and give me the energy. I wonder if we can activate that quartz enough in order to get it to burst because we're not we're not getting quartz to burst. It doesn't even change the light. You know what I mean? Let's yeah. just smack it together. So this is like smacking it from the side with a burst, of, you know what I mean? Like a big burst of energy right to I it. Do. And I want to see if it just doesn't come alive. And even if I don't have the energy pulled out of the system, I just want to see it light up. There's a T. Townsend Brown, I think it's T. Townsend Brown experiment, that uh, he takes a crystal and he puts it between two capacitor plates, just lets it run, and apparently the crystal grows. It grows to a point where it almost defies gravity. Hmm. I don't know. I got a crystal, Crazy. a quartz crystal that looks like a small uh, obelisk, and I want to try the experiment. I just I haven't got to it yet. I'm going to stick it in the center of the coil, and I'm going to pulse it and just see what happens. The Otis T. Carr uh, um, 03B, I can't remember what it was called, but his, his ship apparently had a crystal that came out of the center of the floor, and then uh, waves of light would go around the inside of the craft and he would, they would hear a ringing and they pictured where they wanted to go according to Ralph Ring and they would just show up there. So I kind of wonder if quartz crystals like you said, it would resonate. Maybe that's something to do with attaching to our consciousness. I don't know. Well, when, when they talk about uh, the Ark of the Covenant, they talk about the, uh, the plate on the uh, uh, priest back and it has crystals on it, okay? Yeah. Every crystal resonates at a different frequency. Now, we haven't been able to activate them to turn them on to light up. And yeah. that's the interesting part of it. Can you get each one to light up, you know, based on their frequency? And if you can, I think that's where they were going. You would have to have that kind of technology if Ralph was right. Yeah, and you know what I thought? Uh, I have a theory on that. Uh, when they would light up, they'd give off different frequencies of light. So it would create a field of light or, again, a force field that would uh, stop the radiation from affecting them when they went into the, uh, the, where the Ark of the Covenant was, which is the Holy of Holies, right? So that's my thought process on it because it's gold, gold. It was like right on the skin. It wasn't just over the clothing, from my understanding. I don't know about that, but my theory is is that it would produce multiple frequencies in order for for you to be safe around it. Yeah. So they always put it up on something. They always put it on a the table. They always put it somewhere else. They oh, the never, art. They never grounded it. Yeah. They never dissipated the energy into the ground. So when you came near it. You were toast. Once, there's a story in the Bible where one of the servants was helping carry the ark and he tripped or he fell or something and his hand touched the ground and the ark at the same time and he turned into ash instantly. Yeah. yeah. 
So that makes sense. It'd be like grabbing a high voltage power line and grounding it out through your body. Just nothing left. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, and then it put out different frequencies. So if you had it out of tune, it'd make you sick. You start throwing up, you start being dizzy. Yeah. You would look like you just been through a nuclear war. Yeah. You get pox yeah. on you, you start to bleed. Just everything would fall apart and disassemble you from the inside out. Yeah, there were reports of uh, people guarding the Ark, and uh, they don't end too well. They have short lifespans. You okay, know? that Ark that you're talking about is in Ethiopia, and it's not the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. It's the Ark of Gabriel or the Ark mm -hmm. of Solomon. I think it might be the Ark of Solomon because the Ark of Gabriel was rumored to oh. be um, in, oh, it's in the Middle East where that big cube is. Where they the Muslims uh, walk around that cube? Oh, I know what you're talking about. Okay, well, yeah. in that same area, about eight years ago now, maybe there was a Come riot on. there, and it killed like a thousand people. But the riot was the official story. The actual story was they were digging in that area looking for what they thought was the Ark of the Covenant, and they pulled it out oh, of the I ground. Heard about that. They did. It actually. An EMP went off and it killed a thousand people surrounding it. But that's not wow. the Ark of the Covenant. That's the Ark of Gabriel. See okay, the pyramids. So, uh, give us a breakdown. Yeah, give us a breakdown of that. Because I'm, well, I'm interested I think in it. Each pyramid had its own Ark. But the Ark of the Covenant was in a very specific pyramid. And that was the one that God gave to Moses. When he left Egypt, he took it from the pyramid. Remember, he was a high priest. He knew how to operate everything. So when he took it and it was in front of him and it split the Red Sea and the Israelites went through and got away from Pharaoh, I think that Pharaoh started chasing him because as the story goes, the Pharaoh let them go and said, leave, just get out. Mm -hmm. But they didn't know that Moses took the ark. <laughs> and when they figured it out, mm -hmm. they started chasing him. And that's how all that came about. So, oh wow! At least that's how the story goes, and how the Bible's depicted of it. And there's, if you look in the uh, apocrypha, it talks about that in. I think it's the story of Thomas, but I could be wrong on that one. It's been a little while since I read the apocrypha, but again, this stuff's also in different history books. I believe that the arcs has like been fragmented, arcs, not just one. I believe there's one arc of the covenant. Very interesting, but many arcs. Yeah, one arc of the covenant. Yeah, and that's something that I've honestly been learning now too. You know, I didn't know about the molten sea arc at all, and and like you said, the, what is the arc of Gabriel? You said arc of Gabriel, yeah, and the arc of Solomon. Those are the ones that I know about, but there could be others out there, and the, those are the right. ones that are known as well in the fringe community if that's what you want to call it <laughs> mm. and that makes sense right. if there were like the other legitimate pyramids that maybe weren't trying to or, or weren't copies of the legitimate pyramids because you know, remember we have like two types of pyramids in egypt we have the legitimate you know megalithic structures and then we have like the stone uh, or the um clay pyramids that were kind of like uh later civilizations trying to replicate it and failing yeah. i guess yeah. yeah so like it makes sense that those original designed pyramids um would all be related since they're all related in ge geometry, you know, and function as well, right? They would function the same and require the same components. Uh, so if one required the arc, like you see, uh, the arc kind of fits into the the um, box within the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid Sir, in Giza. Oh, guess, yeah. um, right. I'm I'm curious yep. to to see uh, and look into different areas of those other megalithic structures and see if they have anything similar. You know, I believe the. Uh... What is it called? The Red Pyramid? Uh, there's a, a different name for it, but I believe that one has a sarcophagus as well. It's almost identical to the Ark of the Covenant. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. It, the, Somebody posted something in chat. I'm going to check it out real quick before I... I'm going to vet it real quick before I um, share it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. Interesting stuff. Uh it has to be proven, of course. Right now, it's just theory. But yeah, yeah. Coupled with all the stories that have gone on, Mecca—that's where it was. Thank you, B Sears. 
So in Mecca, that's when it occurred. I don't know when I should say that's where it occurred, but that's where they found the Ark of Gabriel. That's why the Eastern Orthodox uh, priest from Russia, the Catholic priest, came out to Mecca, and uh, the the Pope and the Eastern Orthodox Catholic priest who haven't talked many many years because there was some kind of a falling out between the churches or the factions of churches. Um, they actually got together and had a big discussion. And it's rumored that it was over the Ark of Gabriel. Hmm. So. That, that, That's you know, just as a historical po point, it would be interesting to hear all of that. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. yeah. Just to see where it all came from, what was going on mm -hmm. at the time. It right really now it's perspective on everything. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Um, I tried to uh, copy. It won't let me copy this. So I'm going to, I also have another video I have um, up that I wanted uh, to play that I found of the T Townsend Brown effect. If you guys want to check it out. Yeah, I'll be right back guys. Yeah. Oh no, you're good. I'm going to probably go off camera for a couple of seconds too, but I'm still going to be here. We're <laughs> cooking. <laughs> All right. Me too then. <laughs> <laughs> There's no sound, Ben. Hold on one second. I just want to address one thing Sean Calderon said. The Ark contained mm. Aaron's staff, a jar of manna, and the Ten Commandments. I have it under good authority that, um, yes, you're partially correct. The Ten Commandments are no longer there. There is the uh, bud of Aaron's staff, which is a piece of Aaron's staff. There is a alabaster jar full of manna sealed for uh, the time where the Ark of the Covenant is to be opened. And there is a scroll. And that scroll, it's not the Ten Commandments, but that scroll was instruction on what to do with that manna and the staff when the time comes for it to be re uh, anointed, I think is the right word. I could be wrong on that. But from my understanding, that's that's where it's at. If I'm wrong, I'd love to see it. <laughs> Not saying that I'm right, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So that video actually doesn't have any sound, unfortunately. Oh, bummer. So I, yeah, I'm going to have to find a different video. Well, it's uh, fortunate that Nathan has a plethora of videos for us to commentate on and check out and learn from here, most of which I haven't been able to touch on yet. That's okay. I'm going to actually have to bail right away because I have some stuff to do before the night is through. No, you're good. Um, I appreciate you're you still, stopping by. If you're still on in an hour or two, I might pop in again, right? Yeah, I appreciate yeah hopefully. All the I appreciate the subscribers because I've gained seven or eight since I've been nice. on today. So yeah, thanks, yeah, see? And I hope you and reach a thousand, man, before you end this this stream. I really do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're hoping. Uh, I think we. I think we will. You know, and it, it's it just goes back like again to the psychology of you have to remind people. You know, they forget and they find something interesting and then they forget to subscribe and then they forget about it. You know, so yeah, they're listening in the background and they're not really looking at their screen. Yeah, I get that totally. I've done it a million oh, times uh, myself. Yeah, and I immediately, you know, saw a difference when I started streaming on StreamYards with everybody and, you know, when I was able to plug my channel. And that helps. Networking helps. You know, we can't do this by ourselves. So I appreciate you coming by and and uh, and helping us understand some of these complex topics. <laughs> well, I appreciate the discussion and all the, uh, the brain activity that I needed today, I'm telling you. I still feel brain dead, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Your twenty percent is like somebody else is like one hundred and ten percent. I don't necessarily agree with you one hundred percent on that one, but I appreciate it. All right, so Nathan in the background there, I know you can't hear me now, but you have a good night. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the comment section. You guys are awesome. They've already brought up 
what the Orthodox and Catholic split was all about. It was called the East West Schism, and it was in 1085 by Sean Felder. You guys oh, are yeah, awesome. Yeah, right here. You're awesome. All of you are awesome. Thank you very much, Thank Gerald. You yeah, You're awesome, thank you. brother. You guys have a great night. You too, man. And like I said, if I'm still up, you hop back on. I'll try to be up, you know, if I don't pass out at the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that totally. <laughs> All right, guys, later.